Hello one and all, and welcome back to the RimWorld Eternal Winter Series. That is right folks, we are finally back in business. It's been a little while, I'm not going to lie to you, and we've been working on our Gun Empire series for the last few weeks, but we are indeed finally back. As you probably have guessed by now, we have a lot going on in today's episode. To start, I'm going to be doing quite a bit of construction. We're actually building some new residential areas here, some homes for our people, and that way we can also open up our warehouse and workshop a little bit more. Now I realize having several different types of floor tiles here in the workshop is extremely hideous so I decided that I would make some rugs and try to hide it as best I could for the time being as I do plan on using our stone for some other projects. Just as well though I would also end up making some rugs for our dining hall and I do think they ended up sprucing the place up pretty nicely. This should be a very enjoyable and comfortable place to eat our meals. And now with that completed, I thought it might be a good idea to do some defensive research, specifically into gunpowder defense, which will end up unlocking two different types of cannons and an organ gun, which is essentially a small cannon with several different barrels. I do feel that it's a really good fit for our defenses, as we're normally taking on very large and compact groups of enemies all at once. As we well know, of course, this type of research, as well as most types of research, given our technological understanding and and all that is going to take quite some time. So I just sat back and let time pass up until the point that we ended up having a trader come from nearby to do a bit of trading, of course. It was actually a bulk goods merchant. Unfortunately, this does mean that they weren't interested in buying any of our weapons or anything along the lines of swords or bows or anything like that, of course, but they did end up buying plenty of our pelts and leathers and this ended up making us a pretty little penny of silver. I suppose it's very good that we did make that silver because it looks like we're going to be financing a wedding between Rick and Genevieve. Of course, Rick has proposed and Genevieve, of course, accepted because the two of them are deeply in love. So that is something we have to look forward to in the very near future. Just as well, we have also finished up our research of gunpowder defense, which now means that we can actually build our very first organ gun. I actually end up planning on building two of these, one in each tower that is by the entrance with all the spike traps. Using two of these cannons through our embrasures should allow us to cover the entire entrance here. We also built some sandbags just for good measure, and this was going great until we ended up getting attacked by a moose. Not to worry, though. Now, as we were working on our defenses, we had a few of our colonists focused on making some stone blocks out of chunks, and that way we could actually build some nice stone shelves to further increase our storage capacity in the warehouse. And then we would actually begin expanding the royal family's living quarters just off of the Jarl and Lady's room. I started thinking that Snowdrop and Kaz are both a little older now and they probably shouldn't be sharing the same room with their parents. It only seems fitting that they would at the very least have their own bedrooms just off of their mother and fathers. Now I will say with this large hill that we've decided to build the royal family's rooms, the throne room and everything in, it's a little bit Part because some of it is already dug out, right? There's kind of like a cave system through here, uh, but uh, we didn't have too much issue with it, and we also ended up moving our treasury as well. Unfortunately, though, a few hours into our construction project, we ended up getting raided by House Hess, who sent a decent-sized group of marauders to try and murder us, of course. Among their ranks, it also appeared that they had an enslaved ice mage, someone I would be very interested in capturing if possible. As they began to approach, we immediately began manning our new organ guns to test them out during the battle. So far, in combination with our magical weapons and just other weapons in general, they were doing quite well. We did, however, notice that the Ice Mage and another of the attackers were trying to come up from the northern side of our little town here to try and flank us, so we sent our Blood Guard out to go and deal with him very promptly. As they were doing that, we were continuing to mow down enemy forces until they decided to try and flee the area. Turns out our organ guns were a complete success. Looks like our Blood Guard's mission was going somewhat to plan as well. They were struggling a little bit with the Ice Wizard here, giving him quite the beating as the 
snow poured down, but eventually they did finally take him down and he didn't die, which was a blessing. We could actually capture him and begin trying to recruit him after bringing him back to our prison. First things first, of course, though, we're going to have Sissy here begin tending to his wounds to ensure that he doesn't bleed out on our nice bed. Of course, not using any medicine, though, because we don't want to risk that and then he gets an infection and dies anyways. It's not worth the waste. Though, of course, infections are extremely uncommon here because it's just a little bit too cold for most bacteria to survive. With the threat neutralized, at the very least, for the time being, I've decided to begin digging out and strip mining some of these small hills for their resources, which is primarily granite chunks. We're going to begin cutting up all these stone chunks that we get into stone blocks, as I still have quite a few more construction projects that I would like to try and tackle. One of which we've actually already gotten started on earlier on in the video, of course, today, but I want to build more residential areas, so more little stone cabins, I suppose you could call them for our people. At some point I want this place to look like a small village just outside of a large castle that's built into the hill, and that's kind of what we're working towards with this. And of course, just as well, we still want our larger production projects to have their very own shops and or buildings, so I've actually ended up building another place for our tailoring, our rug making, and our hide tanning operations. Now, the majority of the work that is being performed here is being done so with our muffalo and bison wool, since we have a pretty good supply of that coming in at all times. Shortly after completing that, though, it looks like Rick and Genevieve are now celebrating their marriage ceremony, and I found them here in the war room, which is kind of funny, but also kind of seems like a fitting place, I suppose, for their marriage to take place. Anyhow, though, they were getting into their holy matrimony, and it was truly a beautiful sight to behold. And it looks like everything went swimmingly. Now, I wanted to discuss something that I noticed watching this video and footage back, of course, coming in to narrate. We have Kaz here, and I actually want to uh, give Kaz a little bit more responsibility now that she's older, and I plan on sending her out on her own mission, but if you guys remember last episode, she's no longer named Kaz, at least not her nickname. It was supposed to be Aza, which I, for some reason, had done, and I guess I forgot to save. I'm not really sure, but she is going to be referred to as Kaz has until next episode when I remember to fix the name, so I apologize. Anyhow, though, we've actually commissioned Squiggle here to go ahead and make Kaz her very own set of some iron armor, just something simple that she can wear out on her very first mission. Now, I was trying to think of what we would want to do. We don't want to send her out on anything too super dangerous, of course, but something somewhat simple just to, I guess, prove herself, if you will. I was a bit stumped on what we could have her do, but then I remembered that Yarl Rosh actually was discussing with the trader that stopped in a few days ago about a possible item stash in the northern mountains not too far from home. There is of course a chance that the items there are not very valuable and even if there are any valuable items they're sure to be very few and far between but it could be the perfect opportunity for Kaz to display her leadership capabilities. We would actually send her out leading Piub as well as Squiggle to the item stash. And of course assuming the expedition is successful not only will she earn the respect of her mother and father, she will also earn the respect of all of our noble members under our keep, just as well as a claim to any of the valuable items she may find. The three of them had already begun traveling to the item stash, and the road was long and very cold, but they ended up arriving shortly thereafter. We weren't expecting much, as the item stash was very small, and there wasn't much of note, except for the fact that it would appear that the elves had already beaten us here quite a while ago. Along with them, they also appeared to have someone who was linked with two slasher dryads. Or claw dryads? Uh, you know, the ones with the big claws that'll gouge your eyes out. Luckily, we had just so happened to have prepared for any opposition, and we had Squiggle as well as Pia bring a lot of fire bombs so that we could, well, light the opposition on fire. As you can see, it was beginning to work quite well against the little dryads. The poor little pink bastards were about to be as crispy as fried chicken chicken, but that was alright with us. After killing the Dryads, we would move on to their filthy masters. 
who, for whatever reason, seemed to be adamantly guarding the item stash as they hardly wanted to come away from it to try and fight us. We did eventually bait them into it though and we would end up surrounding their leader here, beating him down. Squiggle had considered crushing his head like a melon, but Kaz quickly stopped her as an elven leader in a nice set of armor like this would go for quite a bit of money. So instead we opted for tending to his wounds. And now it was time for us to bust down the door here of the item stash and figure out what all the fuss was about. There were plenty of items within that we could see, but one in particular began to catch our eye. The glimmer of a blade in the dark. An oddly jagged shaped blade was lying on the ground. It appeared to be some type of great sword, but it wasn't made of metal, no. It was made of dragon bone. The quality of this ancient weapon was excellent. So excellent, in fact, that it actually had artwork engraved on it. The artwork of the weapon was, and I quote, an engraving on this weapon illustrates an abstracted rendering of helplessness. The work is shaded in hues of orange and red. Very vague and very brooding. The Jarl and Lady, as well as everyone else, will be quite happy with this discovery, I'm sure. Now that our expedition is complete and we have all the treasures that we have from the item stash, it's time for us to go and do a little bit of trading with one of the medieval houses before returning back home. As I mentioned earlier, the chief elf there is actually worth quite a bit of money. Uh, even though he is quite injured, we still get around about 400 silver from him, so we've decided to trade him as well as many other items that we received such as the plentiful amounts of pelts that were in there as well as a few weapons and what have you and in the end I think we made close to about 900 silver overall very interesting but something even more interesting is back home in the dead of night as the shadows creep upon the land I saw a very dark and mysterious creature it appeared to be the famed mystical creature known as as a nightmare, a solid black horse with a fiery blue mane. The perfect mount for Jarl Rosh. I sent Lim in to do a bit of taming, and luckily Lim did manage to tame the creature. I was quite concerned, however, because legend has it those who break the spirit of this wild mystical beast are said to experience horrible events shortly thereafter, although it's probably just a tall tale. We then ended up having Snowdrop reach the age of 13, which means once again, it is time for us to choose more passions for her types of work as well as her traits. I ended up giving her a burning passion in construction and cooking and a minor passion for melee and I also gave her the trait of tough as it feels like something that a leader should have. Truly she has and is still maturing into a capable young leader who is worthy of leading the keep and the eternal flame in the future. For now she cleans her father's stables but in another year or so she'll be leading her own expedition just as her sister has. I am afraid, however, that our wholesome moment has been sorely interrupted by an elemental assault. I may have a theory that this could have been brought on by us taming the mystical nightmare horse. Regardless of why, though, we are now under attack. We immediately tried to run into our throne room with as many people as possible, but unfortunately the elementals followed us in there and would continue following us to the library. We would try to run through our massive slab doors to get away from them, but unfortunately they were extremely fast and eventually Rosh fell as Genevieve and our other slave would try to run to the treasury where they could attempt to hide. But unfortunately this would not work either and Genevieve would have to bravely take on three of these elementals all by herself. And shockingly she would be able to hold her own against these lesser fire elementals. It most likely helped that we caught them on fire with some impid breath beforehand. But eventually Genevieve ended up defeating all three of them and she had to make a quick break into the treasury because it was getting extremely hot in the hallway. And obviously of course we did not want her to be cooked alive. Or or bleed out for that matter, so we had her as well as Vasvaran begin tending to their wounds. Meanwhile, our blood guard and Moin Cow had finally entered the throne room and thus the library, defeating some of the lesser fire elementals. They had been caught outside the city walls when the attack happened. They had instructed Moin Cow to immediately begin tending to Rosh to ensure he doesn't die. Lady Zippy and Rick were attempting to destroy the portal, but unfortunately were quickly downed by the lesser elementals. We 
we're going to have to try to find some way to save them, but even the Blood Guard couldn't come out at this time because these elementals would tear them to shreds. Of course, they are very brave and heroic, and they have no issue dying for Lady Zippy, but it would be basically useless if they came out of this door, got killed, and then Lady Zippy bled out anyway, so we're going to have to think of something else. While our Blood Guard was attempting to await the proper moment to pop out and start killing some elementals, we had Genevieve deconstructing a wall from the treasury to maybe come out and try to save Lady Zippy, but she, as well as Vasveron, would be chased down by lesser fire elementals and beaten to a pulp, unfortunately. After they were down, there was really no hope of them getting back up to save her. Lucky for us, though, Lim and Snowdrop had finally entered the city around this time, and Moinkow had finally finished trying to heal up Raj, so I would end up using her abilities to come out and save Lady Zippy, while Snowdrop and Lim would try to take the attention off the Blood Guard as well as everyone else, and try to lead away the Fire Elementals. While they were chasing them, they would also be firing at them, trying to kill as many as possible. Thankfully, Moinkow had managed to carry Zippy to a nearby tower, where she would of course begin tending to her wounds as well to ensure she doesn't die. Then back out on the battlefield, Lim and Snowdrop were doing the best that they could to try and run the elementals around and even trapping some of them within our towers, that way they're separated from the larger groups. I also would have Lim begin using the organ gun against them. Not only because it was very powerful and great at killing the elementals, but also because they couldn't come past the organ gun, but they would end up trying to destroy it, so we began to try and retreat through the towers once more, away from them, hoping to try and trap some of them, but unfortunately this didn't work, and we ended up bringing Moinkow in to try and help out. I'm afraid to say, but it appeared that they were completely immune to her light-based abilities, most likely because they're fire elementals, but I don't know, the impid's breath seemed to catch them on fire, so it doesn't really make sense. Regardless though, they took her down, and we had finally finished off those that were trailing us, defeating the elemental assault once and for all. And let me just say that that is the most intense battle that we have ever had yet in this series. These elemental assaults are always really tough and really difficult, but that one just in particular was probably one of the worst that I have ever experienced even playing with a Rim World of Magic for a year or two now. I will say I'm eternally grateful that the only loss that we ended up having was Robin, though it was extremely sad still, everyone else was just severely injured and none of them actually died other than Robin, unfortunately of course. I did intend on keeping it that way, so for a good time after the battle I just ensured that everyone was nice and healed up, and that way we don't have anyone dying anytime soon. As I was doing that, Kaz and the others had finally returned and actually managed to save Lady Zippy from the tower, and they also would help us out by going around and killing off any of the elementals that were actually left over. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you, but Squiggle here was more than excited to bash in a few elemental skulls like one great big winter watermelon. It really tickled her fancy. Well, that massive attack was was quite the setback unfortunately, but not to worry, we will indeed get back up on our feet just like we always do. We're no stranger to putting in a lot of elbow grease to get what we want, and of course that's what we're doing now, just repairing things and trying to ensure that everyone's okay. However, we would need to take some time out of our busy schedule here to begin building a sarcophagus for poor Robin. It did feel fitting though of course to have one of our Blood Guard members buried in the throne room, especially since Robin and Sissy are the original two, and it also felt that it would be very fitting that Sissy be the one that was allowed to bury her. A great solemn honor that she held in the highest regard. During the funeral proceedings, Sissy would also be the one to lead the sermon and say a few words about her good friend and colleague. And after it was all said and done, the funeral turned out to be good, and everyone would have a mood buff for the next few days, hopefully taking their mind off what happened. Now, if you're like me, you probably saw Moinkow wearing this very strange looking helmet during the funeral. I'm not really sure, or at least I wasn't very sure as to where she got it, but it appears to be some type of ancient helmet from years long, long ago. It doesn't seem to function properly, it doesn't seem like it would give much protection, so we've decided to shelve it in the 
treasury for the time being until we build a nice place in the throne room where we can try to present this artifact properly. I also realized that this relic must have been dropped by one of the traitors that were here originally when the elemental assault had happened. I thought that they all got out of the territory before any of the elementals got a hold of them, but apparently not. Speaking of ancient relics, Kaz slash Aza would take her father, the Jarl, into the stables where she would actually end up showing him the massive dragon bone sword. A sword that she actually decided to give to her father. Even though she was the one that had found it and she had a claim to it, she said that this sword was only fit for royalty. A king. A Jarl. This sword shall now be passed down throughout all the bloodlines to each leader of the Eternal Flame. A family heirloom. An extremely amazing gift for Kaz, or should I say Aza, to give to him since I have actually corrected her name before the video ends. Now, I realize that things have been looking a little bit grim here in this video, especially towards the end, but fear ye not, my friends. We are on the upward swing, and we are going to be back on our feet here in no time. Before that happens though, I do still have a little bit more bad news. Unfortunately, my friends, our Gorilan tree has been eaten by the massive creature known as a Rox, killing our Dryad known as Tim. Our other Dryad known as Burr has been gone for quite a while. I think the tree's connection has been quite low, unfortunately. This is the second time that this has happened to us, and I'm getting quite sick of it, to be honest with you. So we slaughtered this Rox, and we plan on doing the same with any more we find. Thankfully, Hopefully the pods and seeds are quite common, so we already had another in storage. I would attempt to connect Rosh to it, but because the other tree was just only recently lost, it wouldn't allow me to. So I ended up giving it to Snowdrop. Her being the successor to her father's Dryads, uh, it only made sense to me. It's basically in her DNA at this point. With the new tree, I also decided that I would use some of our remaining logs to build something like a spike wooden fence around the tree. Now I do know that this is going to cause the connection of the tree to be a bit lower because of the structures that are around it unfortunately and that is what happened with the last one as well and why we only had one dryad but it is a necessary evil to keep it from being eaten and just as well it should help me remember to not build anything within this area. The threat of being eaten wasn't totally gone though because we still had about three or four roxes within our walls. We would have to quickly murder them so that we don't have to worry about it anymore. I will say though, I almost feel pretty guilty about this. They're coming and eating the tree as well as our crops because, well, they're starving to death. The planet is obviously always in an eternal winter and they don't really have any food in these northern areas where we live. That being said though, I do care much more about the survival of our people than I do about any wild animals, so we're going to have to kill them. Plus, when we kill them, we get more food for our bellies, so it's kind of worth it. But my friends, we are now winding down to the end of today's episode, and I do want to thank you guys ever so much for watching, of course. I want to thank you as well for being so patient with me. I know it's been, it's probably been about three and a half, four weeks since the last Eternal Winter uh, episode came out, so I do apologize about that. I've been focusing a lot on our Gun Empire series, which we just recently wrapped up, so I should still have plenty of time for this series. Um, something I wanted to address that a lot of people have been asking here recently, or at least a good bit of people have been asking, that has me curious. Um, a lot of people are asking if I plan on continuing this series through the 1.5 update with the new DL see um, and uh, you know or if I plan on putting it kind of on hiatus for a little while and uh, that is a really good question to be honest with you I'm not really sure um, I will say I'm sure there's a way for me to keep this series in 1.4 with all the mods and everything and then pop uh, back into 1.5 to do the DLC and everything um, the biggest issue is you know time uh, that's that's a big thing for me and uh, just kind of I don't know staying with a consistent theme I always want to do you know uh, like like for example the gun empire series and this series they were going concurrently you know simultaneously and things were going great and then I just kind of started feeling crunched on time for the gun empire series and we had already been doing this series for a little while so I just kind of started giving gun empire more attention and I have a feeling that may end up being exactly what I end up doing when the new DLC comes out and I do a series in 
you know, the new DLC in 1.5 update. So I guess short answer, will this series be put on hold while we do the new DLC in 1.5 update series? Probably, but I don't want it to. I would like to maybe finish uh, this series before that if I could, although it's less than a month away. Um, best case scenario, I might be able to finish season one of this series if we do uh, some different seasons, which is something I started doing with our Clone Army series uh, a little while back, of course, and that's, that seems to be working out pretty well. I kind of like doing it like that, so that might be in, uh, you know what I end up doing. Um, if it is, I'd like to kind of get your all's maybe suggestions as to what you would think a good end goal for season one of this series is. I do truly feel that this series would be perfect to just continue indefinitely in seasons because we have a hierarchy of, you know, like uh, kids and stuff like that that can actually take over rule of this kingdom when Rosh or Zippy or both inevitably die because, you know, I will end up mistakenly doing something and getting them killed at some point, let's be honest. Or, you know, anything could happen like the elemental assault of course. So yeah, if you guys just want to let me know what you think a good end goal for a season one of this series might be, if you even like the idea of me doing seasons, uh, I think that, uh, in my personal opinion at least, I think that's the best way to go about it, and I think I'd really like to do that. Um, instead of trying to rush to complete this one or trying to force myself to do this one um, as I'm doing another series. Uh, that just doesn't seem to end very well for me when I'm doing that. It seems to cause more issues than anything. Uh, but uh, yeah, just let me know what you guys think in the comment section. As always, I love you guys and I appreciate you. Uh, I'm not going to do any lore at the end of this episode. I feel like I've dragged it on for too long and you guys have most definitely been waiting for too long for a new episode. So, uh, you know, I just want to try to get it out to you as soon as I I can, but uh, I love you guys ever so much. Thank you once again for watching, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.